Just because you move up and promoted or have doubled your salary from an MA to a PA, you treat everybody with respect, but get on people's levels. Joe, thank you for being here and welcome to Rich Nurse YouTube channel. Thank you for having me today. It has been four years since you became a physician's assistant. Some prefer to be called physician's associate. Does it matter to you? No, PA in general is fine. As far as legal purposes, it's supposed to be physician assistant uh, at the moment. Okay. Physician associate, it is as far as online, you'll see some of the websites, the national organization has changed over the associate, but it's still a work in progress from a legal standpoint standpoint. Good to know. So I want to start the conversation by asking you why and how you became a PA. I started off pre-physical therapy, shadowed some physical therapists, realized I did not really like working with injured athletes. At that time in college, I was already deep into the science and math. So I ended up choosing microbiology, finished it out, got a master's in exercise science, worked as a personal trainer, was actually planning to go to seminary at that point. Oh, wow. um, but ended up getting married and needed a job. Ended up finding a, a program in Montgomery, Alabama that was a medical lab science program. And it was one year, it was paid for, and ended up loving medicine. I worked as a med tech for about three or four years. Speaking with some of the mentors, they had talked about kind of some decisions on where I would end up career-wise, whether it was going to seminary or staying in healthcare. And I remember the pastor at our church sitting down with us and telling us, Joe, if you love studying the Bible, if you love preaching and teaching, I'd other people about Jesus it doesn't necessarily mean that you're called to be a pastor. It just means you're a Christian. So you have the freedom and the ability to choose. Saw the opportunity to connect with people in the medical field by not being a seminary student necessarily. I just had the ability to, to love other people well in my community and really invest in them and, and see a lot of major life changes. That coupled with the introduction into medicine for the first time, not being in a classroom and in a lab following the procedure manual was really great, but I just didn't have any time with patients. The only time I saw them was drawing blood. But I really liked explaining to them what tests were being ordered, what the results might mean. And one of my friends was actually a PA, and I had followed her journey as she was going through school. Uh, but she encouraged me to apply. From the time that I decided to when my application was submitted was about two days. It was not the traditional route at all. I had actually all of my prerequisites. Some of them were coming up to that 10-year mark. My freshman science classes were about to expire. I had all patient care hours for PA school, generally you need like a minimum of 500 to 1,000 hours, some schools 2,000 or more. Submitted my application maybe a couple weeks before the deadline closed and then got two interviews, one to Eastern Virginia Medical School and then the other to Mercer University in Atlanta. Interviewed that summer and then got in and started that following January. Finished school up in about 2020. I was the right decision timeline wise and also financially. We were very blessed in a position to not have any student loans through scholarships in undergrad and my initial master's and then going into PA school, I actually did a dual master's in uh, public health and PA studies. Ended up somehow with three master's degrees and no student debt, no loans taken out at any time throughout that whole 13, 14 year journey. What a story. It worked out perfectly for you with the clinical hours and right before the application time and your friend was a PA and recommended it. That's interesting that you were going to go to a seminary school and ended up in PA school with three masters. Right. How did you graduate without student loan? Was it all scholarship? Undergrad, yes. It was actually full ride. And then I worked as an RA, your resident assistant hall director, for all of undergrad and master's. At Auburn University, they paid for your housing. Tiny, tiny. I think it was like $200 a month as undergrad. But then for a master's, it was a fellowship. So they actually paid for your school and for your housing. Oh, wow. And I think at that time, if you're a graduate student, it was like $600 a month. So I did that. I worked in graduate student housing a little bit afterwards, like med tech program, medical lab science program at Montgomery. That was a free program as well. And I worked a little bit during that. So we had money saved up for a few years as working as a med tech. At the time when I applied to Mercer, you have to get into PA school first. I didn't know they had a dual degree public health program. You would defer one year, do a year of public health, and then some of your PA classes would count towards that. At that time, they looked at my application and saw that I had a ton of basically volunteer experience through through church and through working with communities and stuff. They offered me a grant, which was ended up total being about $70,000. That was saving up. I probably had like a couple thousand dollars total when mm -hmm. I finished PA school. Thankfully, my wife was working the whole time. We budgeted really well. When I graduated, the first big purchase that I bought was the ice drinks. 
from the group. <laughs> we lived so frugally while just trying to get by without student loans. We were on the same page, which is a whole nother, you know, marital conversation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we ended up at the place where we were without any loans. I see. Thank you for sharing that because tuition can be very expensive. So I want to like share to people how to get through it without too much debt. You mentioned the clinical hours before applying for a PA school. During PA school, what do you have to do and how do you become a PA? Once you're in, it's pretty fast paced. You have about one year, maybe 13 months of pretty much classroom based work. So that's everything from lectures to labs where they teach you how to do different procedures like start an IV, do a lumbar puncture, sutures, surgical, gowning, gloving, everything from intubations to running a code. So all the things that you would see in your real job, they try to at least give you some exposure um, in the classroom. There's all the other basic stuff like physical exam lab where they teach you how to do a good head to toe exam, how to collect a history from a patient. You finish that one and then you go into rotations. For clinical year, it's probably a year and a half, a year for some schools. Every program kind of differs, but two and a half years of school total. Clinical rotations usually have seven or eight core rotations. So those are things like internal medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, emergency medicine. Some schools have an orthopedic rotation and then usually you get one or two electives. So that could be anything from repeating an emergency medicine to doing something super specialized like pediatric oncology. You finish all that, you take your boards. Ours is called the pants. Once you pass your boards, you can start working as a PA. You have about five or six weeks at each rotation and all those work is pretty much an on-site interview. So a lot of people get job offers during clinical year. Even if they're early on in school, somebody will reach out and particularly if it's one of the providers that you've worked with. Hey, if you're interested, let us know a few months before you graduate. Credentialing takes anywhere from two to four months. You are working at an urgent care in Georgia. After moving to Alabama, where are you working now? Also in urgent care. Okay. So options in Alabama, a little bit more limited, very nurse practitioner heavy. So even as I was looking for primary care and OBGYN for my wife, it was pretty much all nurse practitioners. Part of that is there's not as many PA schools in Alabama. PA profession is a lot newer than the, the nursing profession. I was really only between the emergency department and and urgent care and then some travel jobs but i really wanted to be close to the family okay your wife is also a pa nope she actually did nursing school for a year uh, started off as an english major taught fifth grade for a little bit and then is just staying at home with uh, the kid yeah you have a second child coming congrats thank again you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> joe can you explain to us what your day looks like at the urgent care when you work right now my job starts at eight we predominantly spend the first 15 minutes before the day starts going over labs Anything that went out the previous day or the last few days to Quest or LabCorp, we'll pull up a lab, maybe it's a urine culture, the bacteria that's on there is resistant to the Bactrim that we put the patient. You put a note in there, check your patient's allergies, send in a new medication and have your staff give them a call back. And then once patients start coming in, we pretty much have medical assistants that triage them, get their vitals, start some testing, and then they get put on my schedule. Urgent care is pretty fun. You never know what walks in the door. You certainly get a ton of colds, strep throat, sinus infection. Mm -hmm. COVID's making a little bit of a run right now. Again, it's about to come up to flu season, RSV, that kind of stuff. A lot of minor injuries, fractures. Sometimes it's a dislocation that we need to reduce, whether it's a shoulder, finger, toe. Some, sometimes it's a fracture dislocation of the forearm that we need to set it and splint. Lots of lacerations. That somebody fell and somebody was working at the job site, something hit him in the face. I had a gunshot wound oh. follow-up that came into clinic the other day. That was actually, I think the first one I've had in the last four years was something that they had been seen at the ER. They, they were told to follow up, so they came in. You'll get sports physicals, insurance physicals, department transportation, like truck driver physicals. You might have a migraine come in. We've caught some brain tumors. We've caught some different mm -hmm. cancers, T-cell lymphomas, Hodgkin lymphoma. It's exciting. It, it kind of keeps you on your toes. It's a little bit more fast paced in the emergency room just because it's lower acuity. We don't have CT on site. We don't have labs on site that we need to wait to get back. So if we send off for a CMP or CBC, it's not going to be until the next day when we get those results. Industry standard is to see about three patients an hour. Labor day was a six hour shift. I think I just barely passed six. Yes, the busiest day I've had in the last four years. Oh, wow. Nowadays, I think 
with some people not having primary cares, urgent cares are functioning a lot more like that. So I'll get some chronic management of high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol issues, gout management. We just see people basically until the clinic closes. We take our last patient 15 minutes to close. Thankfully, I've gotten pretty efficient at charting. So <laughs> very, very few days where I'm having to stay more than like 10 or 15 minutes charting. But honestly, when I first graduated in 2020 with COVID, we were seeing so many patients. It would be two, three hours every single day on top of a 12 hour day charting. So it was a lot, but it's gotten better. All right. I can't imagine how crazy it was during COVID. And yeah. that's when you graduated. That's right. Yeah. At the urgent care, you take care of from chronic disease, like primary care stuff to the emergency room, like minor injuries. As healthcare professionals, we all know that PAs are a huge proportion and important team members in healthcare in the United States. I work as a medical surgical nurse and we always work with PAs. They communicate with families and patients. They perform surgeries and create treatment plans. They prescribe medications. What is your thought on current medical workforce and is it working efficiently in your opinion? I think it really depends on where you are. Even just the recent transition from Georgia to Alabama in the last couple of weeks, I'm seeing some differences there. Each state's PAs are under the medical board have different requirements. For example, I was able to do orthopedic injections back in Georgia, shoulder, knees, but I can't in Alabama unless I just through their hoops and, and kind of get X amount of supervised injections and then keep up with a certain amount each year to maintain that. It kind of depends on, on where you are in your setting as far as working efficiently. I think the times that are a little bit more frustrating is our authorizations or just the roadblocks to be able to provide patient care in a timely manner when it's impeded by medical jurisdiction or, or legislation, that kind of stuff. And I get it. These things are in place for certain reasons to protect the patient. Sometimes it's a financial issue on, on keeping certain procedures within certain scope of practice, within certain medical titles, if you will. Overall, I think it's okay. I think talking with the patients in the urgent care and seeing their gratitude for me having the time and expertise to manage their condition. Sometimes when they feel like their primary care is just, again, to meet their quota, rushing through the appointments and not adequately explaining all of their test results. I think I have enough autonomy for right now to effectively manage patients. As far as a broader scope, I don't know. I mean, it's been just a couple states. I've, I've never been really that involved in, in or interested in the political or legislative slide, side of the uh, medical profession, but I have some friends that absolutely love it. Yeah, I think overall where I'm at, things certainly could be improved, but I'm satisfied with the level of care that I'm able to provide for my patients on a day-to-day -day basis. I see. I wanted to learn your perspective as a PA. You moved from Georgia to Alabama. Nurse practitioners and PAs, they can have a different scope of practice in different states. So I appreciate that you touched on that too. At the urgent care, you mentioned the coverage of patients that you're seeing. We all have things that we like and not like about our job. You mentioned prior authorization too. What is it that you wish you can improve on in your role and what do you love the most about it? The variety of things that I get to see, keeping my skills up and then the amount of hands-on procedures that I get to do. You know, I've always loved teaching, mentoring. There's been very few days in the last four years where I haven't had an intern or a shadow or a PA student on site with me. So that's another thing I love about the job is being able to equip the next generation of healthcare providers could be taking care of me or my family members down the road and just have the privilege to invest in them. I get people who are on their very first clinical rotation to all the way to their, this is the last one they're about to graduate. Something to improve on even more than par authorizations is the conversation with patients who want an antibiotic for virus. It's something that happens every day. I can see why people will just prescribe a Z-Pack and a steroid and send them on their way because it's so much easier. It's going to take a fifth the amount of time that it would trying to explain to them antibiotic stewardship. And then you're less likely to get a bad review. And I get it. They're paying money. I don't see medicine as a fast food service type of industry, but some patients do. I mean, I mean, I had somebody tell me, I paid you this amount of money. And if you're not going to give me what I want, I want a refund. Oh, I think wow. there's always improvement in people skills and something that I'm trying to work on to adequately explain the person in a way that they understand that I'm really not trying to hurt them or withhold something good from them that 
their best interest is what I want. And then I would treat them the same way that I would want to treat my family members. But if you've been treated one way your entire life, there's a certain expectation that's set. And so that's one of the things I'm working on is how do we break this mold, spend a little bit more time with patients, educate them in a way that they feel like that we care about them and that we're not the ones who are trying to keep them from feeling better. So at the end of the day, they really just want to feel better. It doesn't matter if it's the, the first one of the day or the last one, but always trying to be present where I am with the patient. That's very tricky when a patient has their own way and is very set about the answer. It just reminds me, I live in New York. We now have a lot of companies that you don't have to see provider. You can just get antibiotics. Uh, that amazed me that it's convenient, but at the same time, there can be a gap in education. Like what you said about covering virus with antibiotic, people wouldn't know. I just thought of that because you mentioned it. Telemedicine is certainly very convenient, but I have a hard time... If I were working in telemedicine, they pay for something. It's supposed to be a quick and easy, like, hey, I've got these symptoms. They expect to get something in return for that payment. And you really can order antibiotics. You can order weight loss medications online now. Like, there's even some clinics where everybody walks out with an antibiotic and a steroid, and that's just their model. If they're financially centered, it probably works well. But have you ever played that board game Pandemic? Heard no. What is it's, it? That's kind of what it reminds me of. It's basically a collaborative game. You're trying to prevent prevent diseases from taking over the world. The whole premise that if we run out of antibiotics, if we can't stay ahead of the bacteria, then we're in trouble. Can't build resistance. <laughs> you had masters of physical activity before you went to PA school. I saw that you studied microbiology and also minored in music performance. You are very versatile. You went into medicine and became a PA. What was it like when you were a PA student and now have experience becoming and working teaching as a PA? What changed in your perception of the role? Not much. And I got into the game really late. My little exposure prior to applying to school was that one friend that I had in college. And when I did shadow, it was very similar to any provider that I had seen growing up. Come in, they speak with you about what's going on. They might order some tests if needed. They interpret those tests and they come up with a game plan or management uh, or treatment plan. I guess my perception going into it, maybe what's changed is flexibility that I would have as a PA. There's a lot more that we could take time to do. So with the public health degree, it's much more community centered. With the physical health degree, it's so much more preventative centered. How can we do all these things, keep you healthy to prevent something? And then with medicine as a PA, it's much more reactive We're on the back end. Like when something is wrong, how do I fix it? In that sense, with the different experiences that I've had, I can kind of see the continuum of, so if I have a patient in front of me, how can I address more than just how do we fix this one issue? So certainly if there's time to discuss nutrition, physical activity, exercise, or even if it's an orthopedic injury, how to work out around that and how to improve the movement patterns or avoid certain movement patterns while we're rehabbing. Those are conversations that are pretty fun. Like that's the flexibility. I'm not in a box. There's a little bit more freedom when it comes to patient education. Some providers do that much better than others. I think that's the beauty of clinical rotations is you get to see a ton of different providers, MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, PAs, how they practice medicine and then hopefully take the best of all of those and build upon that as your own clinician. I was wondering how your background molded you into who you are now. You're like master's in physical activity and also you power lift, I read. So <laughs> your passion and your background helped you focus on preventative care and also MPH and community center care. We are who we are because of our PACS experiences, right? That's interesting. Do you want to add anything to how your MPH and your background helps into who you are and how you practice. MPH is really interesting. If you're not directly in research or directly working on some kind of funding, grant writing, then there really is not as much of a communal role. So I have not used as much of MPH in the last four years as what the training had equipped me to do. My favorite class in that master's was a class called Minority Health and Health Disparities. 
disease. It was basically just talking about all the different factors that could affect somebody's health. Everything at the population level, food deserts, access to nutritious foods, its culture, its heritage backgrounds, what people grow up and, and what they're used to, its stress levels built up over years and years, whether it's due to race or ethnicity or socioeconomic status, that all contribute to a person's health. High blood pressure, for example, when we talk about salt or being overweight are two pieces of the puzzle, but there was a lot of intangibles. Stress that can contribute to that as well. It's not just their current living situation, their current financial situation, their current job situation. It's, it's a lot of stuff that leads up to that. It was really interesting, some of the conversations that we had with our classmates, for example. I remember one person saying that them being a certain race, every time they walked into an elevator, they're very conscious that the women in that elevator automatically grabbed their purses a little bit closer in fear of they look a certain way, and so they're more of a threat. And it's just small stuff like that that they mentioned I had never heard before that contribute to a chronic amount of low-grade stress and that affects their health. It's those things kind of in the back of my mind when I talk through patient education, especially if I have family members in the room, of more than just what that one individual can do for themselves, but also considering potentially other factors that could be addressed. You built a more holistic approach seeing a person. Correct. Yeah. When the time allows, I would like to definitely have more of a holistic conversation. A few months ago, you launched a mentorship program. Could you share how that's going? I think I started taking on students within a few months after I graduated. I'd always kept up with my students after their five or six week rotation with me, just checking in on them, seeing how they're doing, even talking with them, especially after graduation, that first job, contract negotiation. If they're willing to talk about it, budgeting, what's the fastest way to pay off their student loans. As I practicing in, in Georgia, we were very close to a large university, University of Georgia. So we constantly had pre-health students emailing about shadowing opportunities. And they just had a ton of questions. What classes do I need to be taking? How do I get more hours? What, what can I do to be more competitive? What's the best way to prepare for PA school? What's the best way to prepare for the interviews? So I'd already been having all these conversations and had seen some students in the last four years go from a medical assistant through the interview process, get into to school, mentor them throughout their didactic years, had questions about study habits and exercise during school and on into clinical rotations and then interviewing for jobs. And then a few of them ending up getting to hired on. I've seen kind of the start to end of it. So the whole mentorship process is sort of looking at what was already out there because there's a ton of stuff already out there. I hadn't actually seen anybody offer a comprehensive mentorship from beginning to end. So most of them are going to be focused on that free PA mentorship, getting people into school, mock interviews essay revisions. Some people will offer tutoring during PA schools. And that's a smaller subset. And then even small, actually I only found one person who was a mentor for that new graduate PA. And their mm -hmm. primary focus was on contract negotiation and financial advice. How to set up 401k, how much should you put in it? What kind of investment should you do? Should you balance that alongside of paying student loans down? Should you be really aggressive and, and just pay loans down first? Seen anything from beginning to end. And so that was kind of my niche. Work with students in, in all three stages before, during, and after PA school. I've seen a few go through the whole process. I've got three people who've actually signed up for the bigger mentorship practice. Everything else right now is primarily just kind of like a one and done. Like they just want a one hour mock interview or they just want a supplemental essay or personal statement revision. My background on the admissions committee, I've been interviewing students for also about four years. I can help them out with red flags, you know, little things to improve on. And then certainly interview prep of how to articulate yourself well what things can you prepare? How do you share your story in a way that's engaging and memorable? How do you stand out from other applicants? Yeah, I just started a couple months ago. Um, it's fun. I love working with students. I think that move to Alabama prompted this because the two closest PA programs to me are two hours away. I really wanted to stay connected with students. And I guess this is one way that I thought I could try out to stay connected with students. We'll see where it goes. Okay, that's exciting. Do you want to grow this more? What do you envision? With this kind of setup, there's only so much time. I've limited it to 10 spots and I don't want to take any more than 10. I want to be able to give enough focus and time to each person. There's a lot of stuff that we could work on in PA school and afterwards, but I really want to have touch points like monthly with the people. So if it does grow, it would have to be something that's pre-recorded. I don't have to be there in person because there's only so much time. I know that I'll always work with students in some capacity, whether it's teaching in the classroom, precepting on clinical side, or, or doing something mentorship-wise. Over the next 15 
15 plus years focusing on kids and having a good bit of more time with family is going to be important. So I'm not going to end up doing a whole nother like 15, 20 plus hours every week. I'm going to ask you later after we're done what you thought about this interview and what the red flags are. <laughs> Since you said <laughs> you're good at that. You are passionate about setting world records in powerlifting. So I was very impressed by the numbers you laid out in, on LinkedIn. How has your passion in powerlifting started? And do you see any correlation to it in your professional career? It started when I was working on my master's in physical activity and health. I started personal training. At that time, CrossFit was new work. I was hearing about all these people getting injured doing in CrossFit, people love it and it's a cult and all the other people hate it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go try it out and see what the hype is and had a summer promotion. Because CrossFit gyms can be expensive. Some right. of them $160, $200 a month. I joined one. That was the first time I really lifted weights. I was a distance runner before. I was a marathon runner. And so never really had bothered with weights. And I was like, I think I'm pretty strong for my body weight. Let me go on and look at some of the records and see where I'm at. Kind of close to some state records. Entered yeah. my first competition in 2014, set some state records. And I was like, this is pretty fun. Anytime you start something new, doesn't matter what hobby, you usually see like exponential improvement right up front. And so I was in that phase. What about these world records? There was one guy in Russia, for example, that had the squat record at 612 pounds. It took me a, a little bit over a year maybe before I chased that one down. In powerlifting, you can beat records by one pound. So I beat it by one pound. I went 613 pounds. Oh, wow. Five of those eight records were set while I was in PA school. In, in clinical years. So I got to train all throughout PA school, kept up with it. More recently, I've gotten into the pickleball scene. So still lifting some, but uh, trying to play a little bit more pickleball. It's all about community for me. So I had a good powerlifting community before. And then last place where I live in Huntsville, Alabama now, I have a good pickleball community. Yeah, it's certainly a connection point with people who come in with a deadlifting injury or squat injury that I could talk through with them. We're seeing a lot of pickleball injuries, Achilles tendon ruptures. I think I've had seen two of them in person, but I have people come in for not tennis, elbow but pickleball elbow that kind of <laughs> From the orthopedic aspect in the urgent care, being able to talk with people who, who like fitness or even just offering you know, somebody who wants to lose weight and wants to start exercising. My personal training background in the past, being able to give them some pointers on how to start off. What have you found the most effective when asking patients to exercise? Barriers to exercise are one of the first things I like to address. So figure out, obviously they've tried in the past. Most people have tried in the past and failed at some point. One of the biggest things is just finding something that's enjoyable. Identify what's enjoyable, figure out what those barriers are. Is it time-wise? Is it community issue? Is it try to set these extravagant goals right up front, hang on for a week and then give up because it's, it's not a realistic goal. It's really hard if you haven't already built up the discipline on your own to go at it. Whether that's team-based sport, basketball, whether it's some kind of aerobics class, swimming, or something where you can be around other people, there's a little bit more of that accountability there, which is why CrossFit gyms or Orange Theory tend to do a little bit better their push is always that they're going to have more retention and more class signups than somebody who pays the $10 to go to a Planet Fitness is because there's that community aspect there. The other thing would be maybe financially. If you paid a bunch of money, you, you probably are a little bit more likely to go. So that's the big thing. And then actually goal setting and, and starting off small so you don't burn out at the beginning or injure yourself or too sore to continue and, and set that habit early on. I'm going to use them when I talk to my patients. <laughs> it's tricky not knowing exactly what they go through and how financially stable they are. I just thought of runners club and that makes sense, the sense of community that you're better off sticking to it if you have a community that you like. Absolutely. Is there anything that I didn't ask you today that you would like to discuss? At the end of the day, finding something that you enjoy, not compromising on who you are as a person going through it is really important. There's a lot of times where you might be tempted to take a shortcut or do something that I'm just going to do this one time and I won't do it again in the future. And that integrity, not sacrificing or compromising on your character can go a long way. Maybe the last thing would be as a PA or as a provider, anybody in leadership, probably the most important thing I've learned in the last four years was from my previous boss. This guy was an all-star and teaches trauma courses for the Air Force all over the world. You'll see him clean up vomit from a patient room. He'll go in there and mop us. He'll go swab the patient for strep. There's no task that's beneath him. There's nothing that he's going to ask somebody else to do for him that he himself wouldn't be willing to do. And he actually does it. The amount of respect and teamwork and the environment of that workplace totally changes because of that. So that's something that I try to practice 
practice and try to pass on to my students. You don't want to get bogged down in doing other people's jobs, but you don't also don't want to be above it. It's just small things. In my first week, we had a patient who had a syncopal episode and threw up all of the room. And there was already TMAs in there, but I didn't have a patient. So I went in there and started cleaning stuff up with them. And they were so surprised. It was like, why are you doing this? And again, I think it's just those teaching opportunities. You be this person in the future. Just because you move up and promoted or have doubled your salary from an MA to a PA or whatever it is, you treat everybody with respect. Get on people's levels and show your teammates that you're able to go shoulder to shoulder with them. I think that has really created some very great working environment that I'm excited to be there and show up when I see people on the schedule. This is going to be a good day. So there's just another level of trust that's built when we're willing to do the small things for each other. I feel you'll be a good person to work with. <laughs> Being humble, it's so important, but it's sadly hard to find. And also the integrity and discipline. I know how many times I compromise going to work out, not go. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this. It was very powerful. Medicine's hard. It's easy to get jaded. And that's why students are so great. There's so much excitement and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. um, but just surrounding ourselves with people who are excited keeps things fresh. Complaining and, and stuff definitely brings brings people together and can be pretty powerful. But why I love working with students is there's that freshness there that I want to try to maintain throughout my whole career. You mentioned that you also give advice on budgeting and how to get rid of student loan debt faster. How did you learn that and how did you get interested in it? Yeah, for me, it was a lot of trial and error. We've been married for over 10 years. Initially, we didn't really budget and finances was always every now and then come to a boiling point and, and one of our big argument points. It would basically be who's spending money on what, you know, there'd be one purchase that kind of sets things off. But we just didn't really know how much money exactly was coming in and where our money was going. It's brought so much peace and gotten rid of so much stress. It does take work to do, especially at the beginning when you're not used to tracking anything and coming up with your total amount of, of spend, which kind of fluctuates from season to season. So it does take some work and commitment up front, but definitely pays a lot of dividends down long. And, and then it's fun. And it's like, once you see, here's how much money's coming in. Here's how much we've generally allotted for each month. Now here's how much we can give to other people or how much we can save. When you see sacrifice that you've made and it's tangible, it means a lot more. And it's a, that much more of a motivator. When I have worked with people in the past about budgeting, it's like, all right, now I got to pull up all your bank statements from the last six months. Let's try to get a ballpark of how much you're actually spending on necessities and non-necessities, which are totally fine as long as they're within the budget. And then let's look at how much you're making. And if it's a loan situation, whether it's a mortgage or whether it's student debt, all right, let's take a look at the interest rate on these, your amortization plan, how long is it going to take? And then here's small changes that we make and here's how it can make a difference. Once they set that up, if, if they're willing to put in the work, they're usually going to see some progress again, because most of them have not done it before and haven't actually seen the numbers out in front of them. All right. Sometimes you just need that person who you can talk to money about finances because it can be a different difficult topic to discuss to your friends and family. Yeah. And that's where financial advisors are great. We had one that came with our company, just a lot more things, like investments and where money's going uh, that I got to learn talking with some of these kids who are in college. They got a credit card, a lot of them from their parents or, or they're working a part-time job and have student loans and just trying to show them that you don't have to take out the max amount if you don't need it. I know it feels good right now, but you're, you're pretty much going to be paying double. Joe, how can we find you online and connect with you? The website Website that I just started is averagejoepac.com. There's information about me. There's a contact form. My email is exactly the same, averagejoepac at gmail.com. Same thing with Instagram at averagejoepac. That's how you can reach out to me. We'll be happy to touch base with anybody that has any other questions or that wants to connect.